Hello all, welcome to another, another fully booked fun pack session. Um, today we're going to do something a little bit different. So you're used to us doing our podcasts on kind of book reviews with special guests. But when we, when we kind of came across the fellow I'm going to introduce soon, we couldn't wait to do an interview with him. And we, we kind of, we've gone, we skipped the book stage, we always work in reverse, we all read the book, but we skipped the book stage and we tried to get him in for an interview straight away. So as you know, my name is Mason Fully Booked, joined by... French. And Andrew P. And today our special guest is James Sinclair. Yeah, well, my nickname also, can be also, Jimbo. Also <laughs> James Jimbo Sinclair. Be- better known, or previously better known, as the Millionaire Clown. Do you, still, do you still go by that? Well, that was the, the first book was called The Millionaire Clown because I wanted an ironic title. Okay. Uh, the marketeer in me made me think about doing that. And um, yes, yeah, so that's that's why I was never actually a clown. I was a I was a magician, a kids okay. entertainer. We're, but yeah, but the marketing in me <laughs> took over. We're gonna get into that. So enjoy enjoy a fun fact, fun filled session with Fully Booked and James. Yeah, and we're, we're gonna teach them how to speak as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let, I'll let French kick it off. Um, yeah, I guess to to bring it all round, um, I first came around you yourself, James, by, I guess, excellent copy. I don't know exactly how you got my email, but I received the email from oh, you. There you go. And I was intrigued, like genuinely intrigued. Good. And from that, um, that's when I got in contact with you. You said to come down to the business extravaganza. Yeah, yeah. And that was a... Good weekend, really enjoyed it. Well, no. not a weekend, but... Day. Yeah, day, couple of days. That was, what was that, a couple of years ago? No, last year. Last year, right, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah from there, yeah. I asked, would you come on a podcast, and here we are today. Here I am, here I am. Yeah, so Thank today... Thank you for having me, Frenchie. <laughs> Thank you, J- Jimbo. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, so French has actually read... Have you read The Million? Yeah, I've read The Million. So he's yeah. the head of Pops and I. In terms of that, if you want to get that in, uh, just a man. cheeky little plug here. <laughs> get it on Amazon. Make Jeff Bezos some more money. <laughs> <laughs> like he needs it. Yeah, yeah, like he needs it. <laughs> he said, "When French, so French actually was the one that was kind of corresponding with you to get this interview set up." So in the meanwhile, whilst in the in the kind of interim between arranging the interview and getting us down here, and thanks for having us again. Oh, um, nice. I've I've taken I've taken a chance. I haven't read your book yet, but I've taken a chance to listen to interviews done previously. So one of them was. Under the cover, that was, I think it was an Apple uh, uh, interview done with, with Apple. You might, I don't know if you can recall it. No, I don't remember. It's a good interview, actually. Yeah. It's a very good interview. Um, and also, I watched your TED talk as well. Lovely, yeah. yeah. I watched your TED talk. And I think one of the first things that springs to mind for me is I just want to know your history. Where did yeah, you start? Of course, mate. Like, you, no worries. probably detailed this before, but for our podcast, for, for our viewers' benefits, our listeners' benefits, yeah, please yeah, let yeah. us know. I so, so basically I started off as a kids entertainer uh, and I think one of the key differences with uh, my journey to most people's journeys is I had this real vision of what the end looked like you know and I think when you look at successful people I think with the end in mind um, I don't know if you've read the seven habits of highly effective people and that yeah. is so, and it doesn't doesn't have to be taught. It's just something that they naturally do. And I, and I sort of reference people that do well in education, do this as well, or people that do well in a career. You know, when someone says, you know, I want to be managing director, or I want to be a vet, a doctor, a lawyer. When they know why they want to go through education, they're always more successful. And the same is for entrepreneurs and business owners. When they can actually say, well, this is what I'm going to build. Um, they know the destination. Then the journey is so much easier to plot out. Um, so. I knew I wanted to own visitor attractions. I knew that I wanted to build a family entertainment brand. And um, so my first step was going out doing kids parties. So when I was 16, I was earning about 1,500 quid a week doing kids parties. I invested that into property, remortgaged them, um, borrowed loads of money from a load of people, 21 different lenders when I was 20 years old. And we opened our first family entertainment center. Risky stuff, but it paid off, you know. And when you first started, did you have mentors? Because I know in the book you've spoken about how good mentors are. Yeah. But in the in the beginning, so no. when you was at your early ages, at the early no, stage. I suppose the the biggest thing I think I like attribute a lot of success to is I got hold of losing my virginity by Sir Richard Branson mm. when I was 16 years old um, and I read that book and that sort of set me in my path you know uh, because what he really gave me permission to do he said look if someone's not good at something you just employ someone else I to do it and the problem is 
in the UK, and I'm sure it's uh, in other countries that there's this phrase, if you don't succeed, try, try again. You know, our parents teach us that, our teachers teach us that. Um, uh, and that's a problem because actually in the real world, if you're not good at something, don't do it. You know, that's what my view is. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're an entrepreneur, a business owner, you know, you buy in your weaknesses. So from the age of 17, I didn't like administration, organization, cleaning my house. So I was 17 years old, I employed a cleaner, just did it. You know, I didn't worry about how much it was going to cost because that gave me time to do sales and marketing. You know? And that the common trait of great entrepreneurs is being really good at getting customers, doing sales, building a team. And then I got an administrator. And by the time I was 18, you know, I had 19, I had a team working for me. Okay. Um, and I sacrificed my own personal income, really, to pay them, which not a lot of people prepared to do. You spoke, you spoke about the <coughs> knowing the end goal from a young age, but how did you even get to the point where you knew the end goal? So at 16, for instance, you knew where you wanted to be. How, like, what, what led you up to, to even getting hold of Richard Branson's book? Did you have family influences? Did you have friends? Did you have mentors? What, what, no, was, what was James Sinclair like at 13? Yeah, I think, I think DNA plays a lot of, um, plays a lot for successful people. Um, they become obs obsessive over yeah, certain yeah. things. Uh, they have unbelievable amounts of persistence and resilience to the things they want to do. I wanted to entertain people and I wanted to build a business around that. I had a passion for that. Um, and I think, you know, you want to be successful, you've got to find the, the way your passion is, you know, um, because making money, once you've got some money, actually, it becomes, it becomes quite, oh, you know, just more money. It's not the thing, you know. You look at someone again like Sir Richard Branson, right now, this bloke, you know, he's made, he's a multi-billionaire. Mm -hmm. He's just set up Virgin Voyages, his own cruise line ship that's going to go around the Caribbean, the Bahamas and all that. And then on the side of that, he's doing space tourism. Yeah. You know, the, the man doesn't need any more money. It's just obviously his DNA. It's weaved into his fabric. You know, and, and, and I, I don't think it's for everyone to be the leader of such a thing. You know, Steve Jobs said that most people give up in business because they're saying it's really hard. You're on a, this razor edge of success and failure. You know, it's that, it literally is that. You know, yeah. and to keep going, there is some insanity around you. I mean, you, you will. I mean, I did. You know, I didn't go on boys' holidays or family holidays. You know, I worked seven days a week. I DJed in the evening. You know, I had a, a multi-million pound business, and I was still DJing and doing kids' parties. Unbelievable, you know, because the business was burning so much cash, and it needed as much cash as it could. So that that's why I had to go and get my income elsewhere. You know, and 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 I just don't. You know, I used to think, why well, wouldn't anyone do this? And now I think, well, is that right, actually? You know, is it better to be, you know, you know, middle management in a company, senior management in a company, not actually being the owner that has to deal with all that really hard stress, you know? And, um, so I don't, now I've changed my opinion. I don't tell everyone to be a business owner because I don't think it's cracked up for all it's meant to be, really. So would you turn to be? Do what makes you really happy. I mean, because that kind of like sits well with your TED talk in regards to, um, dare I say, the almost like the pursuit of happiness, the, the yeah. pursuit of happiness, if that makes any sense. But through some of the stuff you, you spoke about, I would say, where did a lot of this kind of emanate mm -hmm. from? Because obviously you've got a lot of personality based on a, obviously you being here now, but certainly from what I saw from your TED talk as well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. where did that come from? I mean, you mentioned DNA. Is that something that was in your family? Or well, was I, I think one of the biggest teachings, like when people come to my seminars, I don't know if you remember Frenchie, when you came to one of my seminars, like the, the core fabric of entrepreneurial teaching is, you know, there's that sign up behind, it's called E plus M equals S. Yeah. And that's, that's it's entrepreneurship plus management equals success. And there's these two types of DNA that makes a great company tick. If you look at management DNA and entrepreneurship DNA, we call it the entrepreneurship leadership DNA, there, there's two types of people. I mean, you, and I, the, to give you this real example of this would be education. You've got a teacher and you've got a head teacher. Mm -hmm. The teacher needs the head teacher and the head teacher needs the teacher. You know, the, the teacher is managing the kids second to second, minute to minute, hour to hour, literally to get them through their education. But the head teacher is leading the teachers to push them, to drive them, to get them what they want to achieve. But it works as a plus, you know, it's an equation. Mm -hmm. You know, head teacher plus teacher equals success. You, you, you take the head teacher out of the school, you know, management will they don't try and break things they don't try and innovate things they want a system to work towards and keep it just 
steady eddy and that works and that's great quality management you know you look at mcdonald's or a franchise business that's successful the management are working to a system and then it's the people at the top that have to continue to innovate because if you don't innovate a business you'll evaporate and it's the entrepreneur that should focus on three key areas innovation marketing and culture and that's what i look for in my businesses i don't look at the management day to day i look at the constant innovation the constant management and always trying to improve our culture um, and I don't want to agitate management unless I feel we need to because the market's out innovating us so really what I'm trying to say there is you know, is you need to have leadership and management to build a successful organization and it's two different types of DNA and I definitely sit on the E camp rather than the M camp the management camp yeah because I've listened to one Can of I your, your questions yeah. <laughs> You've, you've spoken on one of your podcasts in terms of the, the traits of the entrepreneurs. Yeah. What would you say some of those traits are? So entrepreneurs like have some really great traits. They have the ability to think with the end in mind. They're hugely passionate. They've got great resilience. They've got natural commercial awareness. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by commercial? They can, you know, have, they know only beans make five and they're not taught that. You know, the kid, I mean, I was talking about this on one of our videos today. The kid that sells sweets at school and he buys them for a pound and he sells yeah. them for £2.50. No one's taught him that. He's just worked that stuff out. He's got some natural commercial awareness around mm -hmm. him. They're great communicators very good at communication so that they, they, they naturally get more sales now sales isn't just to, you know sell products you know sell to someone to come work for them sell to banks investors to invest in them you know sell to landlords to give them the lease for a property i don't know what it might be but they're very good at communicating they're naturally born marketeers nearly and because they're good communicators they're very good at marketing you know they understand that it's important to bring out books make podcast videos you know putting stuff on whatever it you know it's changed now rather than newspapers it might be instagram youtube linky dink you know twit book whatever has come out of the new thing you know they, they've they, they master this marketing um and, and they can lead people really well and there's just some of them um, there's there's others but it, it you know, I do think entrepreneurship is a, it has a, a natural DNA, and then I think with mentors and people around you, you can improve on it. Mm. For example, if you look at great sports people, as an analogy that I love to look at, David Beckham, naturally good football player, give him an Alan, um, uh, Sir Alex Ferguson and turns him into world class. But there was a base talent there. So him, his mentor, has turned him from base talent into world class. You know, yeah. you know Simon Cowell might do it for entertainment. You know, you get a great singer, but give them singing lessons, and they go but there was a base talent there first of all and that's what you know I try and tell people that if you've got a base talent for management don't try and shoehorn yourself into entrepreneurship and if you've got a base talent for entrepreneurship don't shoehorn yourself into management if you've got a base talent for being great on camera doing podcasts then and you're not very good at the written word get someone else that's going to take all your content and turn it into great copy yeah. um, and, and, and and I just think that the faster businesses get to realize they that if you you know you don't have to do the bookkeeping you don't have to do all this stuff that if you're not naturally good at it do the stuff you're naturally good at it and buy in your weakness and I don't, I, I just don't subscribe to the problem where people go, well, it's all right for you to say you've got all these turnover, you've turned millions of pounds, it's easy for you to. I'd, no, because when I was 17, I did it. Yeah. You know, you, you just, um, you know, when, when you see entrepreneurs, they go, oh, I've got a virtual assistant. I go, well, I've got a PA. You know, I tell you, I get more time back because I've got a PA rather than a virtual assistant in the bloody Philippines. You know, how can you get more done if with that mindset, you know? And, and, and I just believe you've got to build a great team around you to get more stuff done. I always say, introduce me to the multimillionaire that hasn't got any team members, hasn't built a team around them. And the answer is no. But you say that, we've, we've got, I mean, I definitely agree with you, but in this day and age, you're getting... Frenchy, let's argue, I love it. <laughs> Come on, boy, bring it on! We're, we're, we're in an era of personal branding, so yep. you can basically upload a few pictures, get a 1,000, 10,000 likes, etc., and you'll have, for example, the latest one, what's that kid, Alex, who done... Um, oh, the, uh, Glastonbury. Glastonbury, yeah. he was on Glastonbury, and he's now... He's become his own brand now, in a sense, yeah. where he's oh, getting, that, yeah, 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 he's yeah, getting yeah. deals from Boohoo and etc. But, but, but Glastonbury made that happen. Yeah, of course. But now, from that, he's now keeping. There's a now. massive team behind Glastonbury. Mm. So once you've got the initial thing, you know that that's, <laughs> you know, another audience has brought him up there. You know. Yeah. So if I went on Dragons Den, for example, as a 
a new dragon, mm -hmm. that huge BBC audience could build me up very quickly. Yeah. But he's not started, I mean, in your personal brand thing, you look at my personal, you know, I employ Chudders full time just to make content every single day, pushing me out there. Yeah. Um, I tweet, yeah, I, mean, I do loads of stuff myself, but if I had four Chudders, I think my personal brand would be four times as big, maybe 10 times as big. Mm -hmm. But what was your point? I need to. I need to. No, because just in regards to you're saying about um, not do, having a team. So, in that regards, he may not have have a team at this moment. But he's now at a point where. But I didn't have a team for the first. I mean, he's a startup in in effect. Yeah. yeah. He's three months old. I didn't have a start. You know, I didn't bring people in until six months in. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it's more what you're saying is did people did like I mean with Alex I mean people bought. He's an anomaly. He's yeah, an anomaly. So, yeah. Not to say this happens we, every we day. Yeah, I mean you can't base your business on the unicorns. Mm -hmm. You know we got to go for the rule, not the exception. Mm -hmm. And will he still be there in five years' time? Of course, will he still be there in three years' time? You know, and but maybe if he built some really smart people around him. And that's enough of I guess leading us on another question. Do you think uh, entrepreneurship can be taught? I think elements of entrepreneurship can be taught, but the real natural players have got base talent. Mm -hmm. You are never, so, you know, I've been doing performance and entertaining. I went to, done some stage school stuff when I was young. I can't sing or dance. Mm -hmm. No one could bloody teach me to sing or dance, you know. But, yeah, stand on stage, maybe entertain a lot, make them laugh. I had some natural stuff there, and someone taught me a few more lines and a few more jokes, and I practiced that, and I got better and better. I can't sing. I cannot sing, I cannot dance. Mm -hmm. You can't teach me to do it. You know, I think with entrepreneurship, there's entrepreneurial traits, but you've got to have that base DNA talent um, to be an outstanding person. Now, I'm not saying that someone couldn't get me to just be okay at singing, mm -hmm. but I'd never be outstanding because, you know, I've, you know it's not for, you know, entrepreneurs think differently you know they they seek opportunity most people don't seek opportunity they want to have a happy life they want to spend more time with their families you know the, the amount of times that you know that entrepreneurship has sucked up so much of my quality life and I just don't wish that on anyone it's so much better being you know a managing director or a senior director for a business you can still and work for this great person that's actually going <coughs> to take it on the yeah you know take the but basically but the way i describe it it's like you're going up a mountain as an entrepreneur but you, you, you've got to carry everyone else. You could be carrying four people, plus you've got this big rucksack full of bricks, which is all your responsibilities and problems. Whereas, you know, the other people could just walk up without the bricks and say, you know, responsibility. You know, we all want to succeed. You know, what makes people happy is, the, is progress. You know, achievement mm -hmm. doesn't make people happy. It's progress. Mm -hmm. When people achieve something, they get this real, you know, like a small feeling of, yeah, you know, you buy a new house. The first couple of days you're in there, yeah, well, look at this, we've achieved, we've bought a new house, look at a great house. You know, 72 hours later, you're back on the treadmill of life, aren't you? You, <laughs> you know, you know, the, you know, you get a promotion or you get a bonus. You know, that, that you have these small, like, like heights of, yes. yeah, this feels good, it's over. Uh, you, your progress is what makes people happy, you know? It's, you know, whatever we do in life, like running a marathon, actually training for the marathon, you know, running the 26 miles, when you get the medal at the end, you're happy for a day, but we go back to work, you know, what's the next thing that we're gonna progress on to? Okay, cool, so you spoke about progress. So, for my limited research, you were in play centers. Yeah. Um, you were involved in childcare. Yeah, big China day now. Farms. Yeah, farm park. What else? Uh, how many how many pies you got your fingers in? We want to know. Well, we have a, we have a lot of pies, but all of our pies fold into what I call existing empire. Okay. So every business has to support another business okay. for us to get involved. Um, and how have you expanded? So. So we start yeah. off, I've, I've been trying to build our business to be as high a barrier to entry every year. So we always try and get a bit higher barrier to entry. What do I mean by that? Um, most people in business go into low barrier to entry businesses. I was going to say, I didn't want to cut you off because I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. But yeah, go on. Well, it, it, it's a bad thing because it's hard to get into, but it's a great thing because you don't it's compete with everyone else. Yeah. So for example, a great way to explain high barrier to entry, low barrier to entry is... Um, in property, for example, mm -hmm. if you want to go and buy a house and do a buy to let single let, most people <laughs> should be able to do that in their life. Save a bit of money, go and buy a house, rent it out. Me, I'm at the moment trying to buy an industrial estate, mm -hmm. and I'm the only person in this race. It's not no one else competing to buy it. So I 
find it easier to get a deal over the line. If I wanted to say, oh, you know, the bigger you think, the less people operate. Yeah. And that's what I like about high barriers. That's what I like about my day nurseries. You know, people, I always tell people, you should open day nurseries really properly. They go, well, hang on, so I don't like Ofsted. Ugh, all the government regulation. Uh, in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Less people in my pond, yeah. you know? And, and the, the bigger you think, the less people operate. You know, I always say this, a uh, great analogy on hotels as well. Anyone could probably go and open a six, eight bedroom B and B in any yeah. town by and you know I will think I want to open a five hundred bedroom hotel with a lazy river going around the edge, ten tennis courts, you know, and, and less people think like that. Yeah. So I want to be higher barrier to entry so less people operate. So I love this personal branding stuff, you know. The bigger my personal brand is, the more doors I can open for my business, the better that I can attract great talent to come work for me. That's my primary reason for doing personal branding. Um, and you know that you know I had a shopping center come in and talk to me only a few weeks ago. They'd seen some of my stuff. They said, hey, can you open nine family entertainment centers for us in our shopping center? They came to me because of my personal brand. That's brilliant. So, you know, it does work, this stuff, but, you know, people give up because it's like you don't see returns for like a year, two years, three years. I know of people that have been on YouTube and they start seeing the returns at year seven. You know, that's, that's barriers there. Mm -hmm. That's friction to success. And, and sometimes that friction can, you know, really help you. So, um, so in, in, in answer to your question, we've got commercial property, um, we've got a business training company uh, called James Sinclair Enterprises where I teach entrepreneurs to sort of success. They come and sit with me, uh, they come to my seminars, I help them grow their business faster than they ever thought possible. Um, we make teddy bears, we make over a million teddy bears a year and we sell them around the country. Um, so like um, that, that picture up behind you there, so like a the children make them themselves. We sell them to Christmas grottoes, theme parks, and we're trying to do a deal with Amazon right now. That's dope. Um, so yeah, it's a, that's a big business, a startup business that we started three years ago. So that's really going like gangbusters now. Um, I write books. Um, we've got a water park in Eastbourne. Uh, we've got nine family entertainment centres, a farm park, and the day nurseries. Oh, and three laser arenas. So we're family entertainment centric, really. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I guess we're a podcast about books, so we, yep. we discuss self-development books and things like that. What books would you say are have heavily influenced you and the way you may think now? Okay, so um, there's there's some real corkers out there. How to Get Rich by Felix Dennis is a fantastic book. He's dead now, but when he died, he was worth about half a billion quid. Um, that's a great book, a great book, especially if you plan on employing people, getting into business. Um, there's some really good personal development, good stuff in that book. Mm -hmm. um, next book, Losing My Virginity by Sir Richard Branson. That's uh, you know, a corker. Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. That is just a great, fantastic book. Uh, the Experience Business and the Millionaire Clown and Getting Customers <laughs> by James Sinclair. No, yeah, who's going to plug them they anyway? Who's going to? boys! <laughs> they're the best boys! <laughs> Big dogs! <laughs> um, they're the big dogs, yeah. Um, uh, if you, marketing, getting customers, anything by Dan Kennedy, they're yeah. really good books. Um, and there is always, there's another, what's the other one I always say, Chance? On the three, we, we did a video on this on our YouTube channel, uh, the three best business books to read. Um, shoe Dog, um, oh, I'll tell you, another one, Taking People With You. Um, is a really good book. It's um, run by the. It's wrote by the guy that uh, looks after the biggest restaurant chain in the world, which is not McDonald's. Um, it's the it's the company that owns Taco Bell, KFC, okay. and Pizza Hut. Okay. And so together, they're actually bigger than McDonald's. That's a great book uh, for growing a business. Um, there's you know Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is a great book. Classic. Uh, I, I, I did listen to very recently, and I, I have to admit I loved it. Is uh, 10x by Grant Cardone. That is a fantastic book. The way he reads that is super. Yeah, I've not read his book. I've watched his content. He's very loud. Yeah. And brash, which is it's fine. I think at the end of the day, it, it, when it comes down to the message, as long as that message is the guy, got, the guy is worth a serious amount of money. Yeah, yeah, he's done like, it, definitely. You know, he's, you know, he's he's sixty two years old and going. Like Strong, going for yeah. it, you know, and yeah. it looks great for sixty two as well. It looks, yeah. it looks fresh. And I, 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 the more time, the more stuff I see of him, you know, and it's a basic marketing thing, you know. He, he, he attracts or repels, mm. and I think when you attract or repel, you you bring a great audience. Something. 
or you repel an audience, you know, and, and that's why, that's, if you look at politics, the most successful people in politics always attract or repel the vanilla mm -hmm. in the middle. Mm. You know, you've got to be pistachio ice cream sometimes, you know, you just got to be slightly different. You know, you look at someone like Donald Trump, Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson, Jeremy Corbyn, they attract or repel. And, mm. and that's why they have got where they've got to. Would you, see, would you say you need that trait in business or just being an entrepreneur? Like you've got to be on one side of the well, other. I think, I think entrepreneurs do, for the most, attract or repel once you get to spend time with them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you speak about the... Management need to keep everyone happy, but okay. entrepreneurs sometimes need to be, you know, <laughs> a bit of a firework, you know, to yeah. get things over the line. I mean, you, what, you look at politics and you will see this over history is exactly, you know, what business owners sometimes need to just see how have they done that and you look at all the successful politicians they're natural born marketeers mm -hmm. they just are mm -hmm. but give an example you say politicians did you say yeah like boris johnson attracts or repels and there's very high chance he's going to be our next prime well, minister that's be done tomorrow but yeah well kind of away from him because i think he's a very obvious one yeah but donald trump is another one like he attracts people mm -hmm. like there's some people that absolutely love that man mm -hmm. and there are plenty of people that absolutely loathe him mm -hmm. But that gives him real strength and power. Yeah, definitely. Was you going to ask another question, Pete? No, I mean, he, like I said, was he give another example and he gave another example of someone I didn't want to hear, but, <laughs> I, I, but I'm sure he can continue down well, that Jeremy road. Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn. So, I mean, you know, Donald Trump, right wing politician, yeah. Jeremy Corbyn, left wing politician, is doing the exact same method, but on the other scale. There are people that literally love Jeremy Corbyn and there are people that literally loathe him. Mm -hmm. But because there are people that loathe him, he actually has people that love him. When you do what I call the vanilla ice cream approach, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, they're, you know, yeah. But you don't stand Easily up. forgotten. Yeah. yeah. You don't stand up. Was you going to ask something? And would you, sorry. And, sorry, I want to make sure I formulate my question. But because you discuss what pistachio ice cream is a particular style of ice cream. My question almost is like, where where does that kind of like emanate from, or where does that come from? Because I'm not, obviously you've gone gone through your background, and you say you left home at obviously at 17. For me, when I went well, to the, for me, what, yes. in, in context. So when I started out in my business, I was called Jimbo the Party Man, and I used to go and do kids parties, and I would entertain the adults. It was very unusual, you know. Usually it was like a bloke with a waistcoat, bow tie, and he would go in a puppet booth. And that was it, you know, when I started it, you know, I used to get inside a balloon, make a child fly, make the whole place cover in snow, confetti cannons. Um, I would take the mick out of all of the adults in the room. I was loud. And some people at first didn't like me, but I started to build a following because the people that didn't like me made the people that liked me really like me. Yeah. And I could then charge more than anyone else for the, because I had a, a, you know, rather than a, a volume of audience, I had a depth of audience. And what pushed you to be that type of character? Because when, like, sorry, it's very good. When I, when I, when I, when I, when I am, <laughs> and would you like that in school, sorry? I was going to Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I had some people that really liked me and people that probably really didn't like me. Because when I went traveling, I, I couldn't pretend when I got back that I didn't see or know certain stuff. So I want to know whether it's based from books or of your own experiences, was there almost like a, a turning point where you couldn't pretend this is what I can see and this is the road that I'm going to go down, whether mm. it's something in, Oh, something, I mean, there might be a hit one. I'm sure there are hidden gems in your book to which you learn along the way. Or there might be like gems in... Unfortunately for me, you know, I left home when I was 17 and I... Oh, oh, sorry, and you've said it a few times, I want to catch it now. Why? Because, fair enough, you're an entrepreneur, you're making money, but was it circumstance or a conscious decision? And then you can continue. It's only because you've... You said it a few times, I haven't butted in, and I want to know. <laughs> well, so there's two questions here. Yeah, there Let is. me go over there. The, th no, the no, first no. question, I left home when I was 17 because my mum had MS, multiple cirrhosis. Um, she passed away, and um, <coughs> I'm not getting upset about it. I'm talking easy. I have actually got a cough. Um, and um, I, I lived at home with my dad and my stepmom, and I wanted to start my own business, and they really weren't behind that. And I, well, I'd started by then. Yeah. So I just left because I don't want to be surrounded by mood hoovers and dream stoppers. So off I went and very quickly that gave me the catalyst to really keep going and do things faster and quicker because I wasn't ever going to go back and say, oh, I didn't make it. Mm -hmm. You know, I was off. Ta-da. Okay. 
They'd say that's right though. You know, I'm not saying that's right at all. But it's just the way, you know, I wanted to go down that route. Okay. Yeah. I think that's the case. Um, it's, it's the case more often than not in that people like yourself kind of like take the jump and take the leap. Because I was yeah. listening to something recently where uh, I see more often than not, I think people will make a decision Well, happy to... family probably does hold you back. If you, yes. You know, if, I, if I had a really happy child and wanted to be there, my mum was still alive. My granddad died three months before my mum. He was my driver, take me around to all my shows. Uh, you know, if everything was, I probably wouldn't have what I have now. But that kind of like brings me to a point. What made you jump? But you're, obviously you're talking about the passing of your mum and also your granddad. Is that something that, you know what, that kind of like, not supported you, but gave you that? No, so I had divorced parents. So this is the other thing. So it's, it's, it gets really complicated. This how long you got. You know, so they, you know, they just weren't, you know, there. And, you know, when mum died like that, oh, you're spending too much time with Nan and, that, you know, and all this sort of palaver. I, so I said, all right, I'm off then. Tell her. And it literally was so easy. I felt like this massive relief, like, yeah, it's all down to me now. And I worked, and I really worked. And you're still working now? Yeah. I might work really hard then. I do more up here yeah. now, but then I worked up here and physically. I mean, I was doing like 15 shows a week. It was ridiculous. You know, I was good at it. You know, but actually, because I was good at it, it probably stopped me from doing the better decision making, like wealth creating stuff that I'm doing now. I was doing, I was, I stayed, because I was good at it, I stayed too long, I think, as an SME mm -hmm. rather than thinking my true potential. Because when people are booking you and you love making people laugh, but I was really happy at doing that. And then I got even more of an entrepreneurial bug. I was going to ask, at what point did you go from an SME to, I guess, a, a big business? So we built, um, I was petrified that my hands earned all my money, literally as a magician, you know, you make all your money with your hands. So and we, so we built an agency, that was the next thing, like an entertainment agency, then we done an events business, then prop hire and all of that. And I just realised that, you know, this is not a great business because your customers don't repeat. Like we'd go and do a wedding for someone and they'd love us, we'd do a great job and we'd say, look, you know, if you get divorced, would you think of us again? You know, like there was no chance for getting this residual repeat business. Um, and that's what I love about day nurseries, for example, is you sign a customer up and they're with you for four years and they pay you every month. Mm -hmm. You know, I just prefer being around, you know, regular automatic residual customers Right, and, and so only some businesses have that. But if you have the mindset, I call it the investorpreneur rule. So if you see what an investor seeks profit, an entrepreneur seeks opportunity, you fuse the two together, you're seeking profitable opportunities. So now I would only look at businesses that, you know, that they can scale easily, um, you can find management easily, um, they have residual income, they have high profitable sales. And I was in these businesses that didn't have those things. And so I had to pivot <coughs> and create an ecosystem, if you like, that allowed for those things to happen. So you come to my farm park, mm -hmm. you know, that's one-off customers, but we've got a, far, a day nursery on site that allows us to have residual customers. We built a membership arm so you can pay by direct debit to come here as much as you like. So we build all these different businesses around the core business. Moving slightly back onto the books topic, how often do you read, if you do read at all? Yeah, I read a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, I read a lot, I listen to <coughs> a lot, I watch a lot on YouTube, and I read a lot of newspapers as well. News is what I read mostly, but mm. decent news. So from like broadsheet papers, okay. not not like... Tabloids. Yeah, not tabloid stuff. And it would be uh, driven around business and politics. Um, I, on the Sunday, you know, in the Telegraph and the Times, I love the business section, the business and money section. Like, there's some great stuff in there, it's quite... There. So it's not... Uh, political news, but it's around SMEs and business stuff, you know, and, and there's some little gold dust in some of those, you know, pages, you know. Yeah. What about uh, fiction books? Do you read anything like that? No. I think the last ones that I read <laughs> <laughs> were Harry Potter when I was 16, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's just not for me. Movies, damn, I love a movie. Yeah, I really do love a movie, yeah. Okay. Um, why, when I was listening to your Under the Cover interview, um, one of the things that cropped up was about building a business that someone eventually would want to buy. Yeah, so that was one, one of my investorpreneur rules. Right, so why is, tell me more about <coughs> why it's so Well, important. most people build a profitable job, not a profitable business. Mm -hmm. um, and so a business that is, you need to be building an investment that someone wants to buy off you, period. Um, so I, I realised this 
quite late on into my career, I'd set up a bouncy castle business. Who's one of the biggest in the southeast? An entertainment agency, one of the biggest in the southeast. No one wants to buy those businesses. You know, you don't get private equity wanting to buy those businesses. Um, and that, that was a big failure on my part. So like, when you look at day nurseries, there's pension funds, private equity. You build a good one, people want to buy it. You know, here's a big thing, right? You build a restaurant that turns a million quid that makes a quarter of a million pounds profit. You build an insurance brokerage that turns a million quid that makes a quarter of a million pounds profit. I want to buy the insurance brokerage. Repeat customers, loyal customers, easy to scale. The restaurant business... It's always going to be key man, owner managed to be successful. Some businesses to be successful just need to be owner managed. And that's just the harsh fact and reality of it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and you say you got into that late. Yeah, but I didn't realise that. Because there's a couple of things that you said. You mentioned you're not too sure whether it's best to be like a manager director or an entrepreneur. And then obviously, I think based on your TED talk, you spoke about... <laughs> Um, like having depression or getting to that point. Yeah, yeah. And is I've there like a times. correlation between the two stroke three? So the, the reason I sort of went on a bit of a wobble was because I worked so flicking hard when my mum died and granddad died. Like I was doing seven day, and then all of a sudden I got happy. You know, money was coming in. I felt a bit more relaxed. I can remember, you know, it was like I was about twenty six. You know, I just bought this really swanky penthouse. You know, I had a nice car. Everything was good uh, i just taken in investment money actually we had plenty of money around us it was it was a nice time and then all of a sudden i just felt anxiety every day and you know i because I, I hadn't addressed like having such a tough childhood really there wasn't anxiety about business then so i i didn't really know why i had it you know it was just like i'd work tough and then so i saw it out and it was a good okay. I've heard you speak about um, gratitude, like being grateful. Yeah. Um, how do you how do you remain grateful but still want more? Well, I don't think I'll ever be satisfied with my lot. Mm. Yeah. Not not from a. I'm not really bothered about having lots of money. I just like creating things, doing things. You know, like things that really get me going. We just built a train track here at Marsh Farm. We're going to build a water park next year. You know, yeah, it's not like saying. Oh, I just bought a Ferrari, or, you know, I would get more kick out of building an attraction and seeing people enjoy it. Now, I am a man of profit, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know, I don't, you know, I am a man that wants to, you know, but the profit creates more opportunities, allows you to do more stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm very, I, what the probably most grateful is that I'm, I feel blessed to work with people that I really like. I spend more time with the people in this room where you're filming this than anyone else in my life. And I think if you don't enjoy the people you work with, then that is a waste of life, isn't it? Because mm. money just, when you break down money, like, you know, once you have a certain amount and you don't have to worry where the next 20 quid's come from. I've, I've met people that are multi, multi-millionaires, yeah. like seriously wealthy, like, the, you know, they can't live in this country wealthy. You know, they're just exactly the same as me. They're still very, Good with their money, they don't, you know, they've got they might fly private jets and that every now and then, but actually, they're very normal people. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's about who you spend your time with that really is the, the route to success, I think. I mean, cool. How bad is it if you make loads of money but you don't enjoy the people you work with? Oh, awful. Well, I make sure I laugh every day I come in here, yeah. but we get stuff done too. <laughs> yes, they're done too. Um, before we, we close up and head off, I wanted to talk about just briefly, I guess how you went about writing your book and yeah. what was well, what I was struggle the, with what was the process so I, I start books um, thinking about them as keynote presentations because that really de-escalates the the complication of them so if you think you're writing a keynote presentation you do an intro and then you would write you know a hundred slides if you like with chapters or headings they become your chapters and then you speak in between them uh, it be it gets easy now because I do so much speaking and stuff and I know so much of the content. The reason I still write them myself and not just palm it out to like a ghostwriter is because I want to know when people quote back to me stuff. I want to know the inside and out of it. Mm -hmm. But it is something that I, is not a, naturally, a natural talent of mine. Mm -hmm. So I have to work at it. How long did it take you to write The Millionaire Club? Oh, six months from start to finish. Six months on the other one. When we say six months, is that eight hours a day? Is oh, no, no, like, no, 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 no. If, I, if I, I could do it in two weeks if I focused on it solely. Yeah. 
once you get past 10,000 words, like you're like, yeah, <laughs> come on it. You know, they're, they're like 40,000 each, you know, but, but you know, I'll, I'll hopefully by the time I die, there'll be 40 books I would have wrote that I can see that quite possible. I have three, I'm, gonna, I'm starting another one on property investment now. Come on to property, but what got you into property and how many do you own? Or roughly how many do you own? <laughs> oh, I'm not going to share that on here, but we have we have um, yeah we have a lot of property and and we now focus solely on commercial. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've built a a large multi million pound property portfolio. Yeah, I think it's an important thing for entrepreneurs to do for a number of reasons. Number one, you have property, you can give it to the bank, re leverage it off of for security to re borrow. Yeah. That's a great thing. If you get ill, you die, your family have still got some tangible stuff because not everyone can come in and run a business, but a lot of people can manage your property portfolio yeah, yeah. for you. Um, it rises in value and you get income out of it. I mean, I always buy property on, on cash flow first and capital growth second. Okay. In fact, I've, okay. I've forced myself not to ever buy a property thinking in the future this will be what it's worth. I always think, well, what's the cash we're going to get out of it on a monthly basis? Okay. So, you know, I like grotty industrial estates. That really gets me going. <laughs> Someone said to me, do you want to own that industrial estate that's got like 40 units on it, all grotty little tenants, or, you know, a private jet. I'd rather have the industrial estate. Why is it? Well, just because like, it gets me going. I think it's income forever. Yeah. Yeah. It's just okay. the way I, literally, I would get so, so excited about buying an, a commercial industrial unit. Just really gets me going. I love looking at them. I don't know, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, no, not at all. Other people want to go on holiday. Like, I really would love just buying and when you get one over the line i love the structuring deal raising the finance for it you know looking after tenants and yeah, yeah. it's an entrepreneurial dna yeah. Isn't it? yeah just i love it you know i try to show aaron our md this thing i was buying it i mean there's like some grotty old units you know and stuff but i know i know there'd be tenants forever and there's good cash flow from it yeah it's just who i am a right. freak, but unique. Nah, not at all. Not at <laughs> That's all. me. Oh, well, unique, but not a freak. <laughs> um, boys, did you have any more questions? Yeah, I've got a couple of other questions. Um, what advice would you give to someone starting out in business now? And what are the businesses of the future to invest in? Uh, so the first one, um, make sure you've got margin in your product. Um, focus so that you can have an experienced business, so you can give your customers cuddles. Um, customer cuddles are really, really important. Um, so Apple do this and Disney do this so well as they look after their customers because they've got so much margin in the product. Um, the, the highest possible margin is so important. Um, what to, I think of, so margin is really important uh, and thinking with what does it look like when it's finished and give yourself a finish date for your business, what your profit's going to be, what your turnover's going to be, what your team's going to be, what the culture's going to be and what do you have to do, what do you have to become, what do you have to do to have this business. So you work it out in the end of 12 months and the end of five years. You should say your business is finished within five years in most cases. Okay. And that's when it's you build a business to sell even if you don't want to. Yeah, that's something that he was very adamant yeah. when he was at the, the network conference. And yeah. I didn't think about that until then, like until you actually mentioned it. He said, well, there you go, French. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is the ultimate thing. You must build a business to sell even if you don't want to because it yeah. puts the disciplines on you to do things quicker, faster and more efficient. Yeah, no, definitely, I agree. And any advice, any tips on the business of the future? Where are you heading down? For the next five years, ten years, what, what's, what's really going to... So for SMEs, you should focus on the experience-based businesses. Well, I wrote this book, The Experience Business, because that means that you compete. You, you don't compete with the big boys. So you know you don't want to be Tesco's. You want to be Harrods, but strong and stable. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, less customers, but far more loyal customers. Big businesses have fickle customers. There's always the unicorns like Apple, yeah. a big business that does have loyal customers. But Tesco's can, you know, their their customers can hopscotch the Lidl and Audi and Asda, yeah. you know, very easily. Mm -hmm. So the, the less customers you have, usually the more loyal the customer is. Now it takes a bit longer to build an experienced business, but that is really essential for. Uh, entrepreneurs and I believe then they should pull the cash out of that and invest it into bigger companies or into property and really mainly property um, and that's how you build your wealth um, so that doesn't tell you the type of business but you know I think um, 
what the businesses of the future. Ugh, I hate this when I'm asked this because I, I I don't want to. I don't want to. It's been recorded. Yeah, I don't want. <laughs> no, I, no, it's not that I don't know because I don't think anyone really knows. Yeah. The world yeah. is changing so much all the time. Um, this, I just know that the traits of a great business. What does the perfect business have? It has loyal customers, not fickle customers. It has margin. Um, it has repeat customers. You know, when when someone transacts, you look for businesses that have transactions of four in quick successions. So what does that mean? The reason day nurseries are profitable and so good and so investable, in my opinion, is because people transact with you four times quickly. That drives loyalty. Um, the reason Netflix is so popular is because you transact with the program or the, the uh, the app, if you like, four times very quickly. You watch Stranger Things. You want to watch the next episode, next episode, next episode. It brings you in and it makes you a loyal customer. And that Sky TV is another one. You know, you're always going on. You know, you're always using the internet. You pay every month. Your mobile phone. You transact four times very quickly. If you transact just once, it's hard to get loyalty from a customer, and they might only need to transact with you once. And that's the that's the big problem. The rule of four, very rule important. Four, right. Key note. Was something I missed. What is a Myers Bridge test? That's a personality test. Okay. Um, what are you? Pardon? What are you? Oh, I come out. Well, yes. When yes. I done it, it comes out sort of entrepreneur for me. Did you, know, did you know the letters? Yes. What? Yeah, I don't. I can't remember when I done it, but there was a free one on the, um, on the, um, on the internet. Okay. But yeah, I mean, big companies use that to put teams together and there's some controversy like some of our team just don't like the idea of it but it shows that I think there's 16 personality okay, types okay. Um, and you, when you're putting a team together if you know what those personality types are then come on the perfect team yeah yeah okay all right well before we wrap up I know you're going to be bringing out another book soon do you yeah. want to give it a little plug yeah the new book is called getting customers faster easier and with less money than you ever thought possible it's going to be on amazon and jeff bezos is running out of money so <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he's going to get most of the money but it's going to be a great read for you and we'll bring it out in audible sometime in august as well uh, but if you go on to my website jamesinclair.net uh, you can get my book for free just pay the postage and package in and we'll send it for free I invite you to one of our seminars as well to help great business free and that's how good we are and we'll be promoting James Sinclair's book on our Instagram page. Beautiful, lads. Yeah, beautiful. First. Beautiful. You're all going to follow me on LinkedIn. It's already, it's already done. LinkedIn, done. Already Instagram, done. Twitter, We're massive on Facebook. LinkedIn. Yeah, Twitter. I, I've just started on Twitter. Pl we'll plug. Mate, I, I'm plugging plug Twitter away. away. What are we on Twitter, <laughs> Chance? Uh, James Sinclair 85. James Sinclair 85 on Twitter. Instagram underscore James Sinclair. We're putting some good stuff on. On, uh, to, uh, on Instagram, aren't we? LinkedIn is where we put a load of different stuff as well. We've over 30,000 followers on LinkedIn, so check us out on there. But the big daddy, the one that you'll want to be on, is the YouTube. The YouTube, <laughs> James Sinclair on there. Subscribe, hit that notification bell, and the gods of YouTube can notify you when we bring out great new content to grow your business. That's what I say on every video. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, 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 guys. I enjoyed that. That was, was good. good. Cheers, Thanks, James. Thank you. Is it the best one you've ever done? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, not possibly, there. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>